I'm glad to be here. There's a, there's a, the verse in the Bible that says, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Say it with me. This is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Now, I put a little bitty emphasis on it. You know why? All the money in the world, all the money in the world stacked up, couldn't buy back one single second of yesterday. It's gone. It's gone. It's history. You'll never relive yesterday. And if you've studied the Bible, the Bible says, boast not yourself of tomorrow. You have no comprehension what one day will bring. So that's why this is the day the Lord has made. We need to learn how to live in the now. Learn how to really maximize the moment. Uh, a lot of people intend to get closer to God later than they are right now. You don't intend to meet God like you are right now. There's some things you want to get cleaned up, fixed up, shined up, polished up. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, uh, now, I, I, I know it's true in all, all of our lives. If we get word that somebody's coming, you know, we'll clean the house different, won't we? You know, it's fine for us to live in, but when company's coming, uh, talk about cleaning the house, this doesn't have a thing to do with the message, but uh, uh, years ago, uh, years ago, my wife, she, uh, she got a flu bug or something, and so she was, she was in the bed, and so she's back there, and so she's back there in the bedroom, and so I'm, I'm off down in the study, and I hear her. She says, Bobby, that's her, Bobby. So I, I go in there, and there she is. She's laying in the bed, and she said, would you do something for me? And, you know, I says, well, sure. I thought she might want uh, some water or some soda or uh, something, you know. But, you know, Bobby, would you do something for me? She's just got uh, the flu or something like that. And so I said, yes, I will. I don't know where women get this. Here's what she said. Will you clean off the top of the refrigerator for me? What? Yeah. I didn't even know we had a top of a refrigerator. I'm always looking in it, not on top of it. But can you imagine that? Just laid there long enough to realize uh, that'll be a task for him to do. Why would you? But I thought, isn't that something? Let me tell you another time. My wife went off when we, we got, I got two sons. One's 46, now one's 41. But this is when they were little. They were little. My wife and a whole group of ladies go off to a woman's conference somewhere. So I told her, go ahead. I'll tend to the boys. Oh, yeah. Can't you see disaster coming? Go ahead. I'll tend to the boys. So uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty bad. Uh, so uh, I decided I'd cook for them, and I don't know how to cook. So I thought, you know, I'm going to cook something that'll go a long way. And I thought, rice. So I got me a pan, of, pan about this big around, about that tall, and I fill it full of water. And I read it, said you put some salt in it and get it boiling. So I got the water boiling, got the salt in it and all that. And I thought, well, there's three of us. So I got down a two-pound bag of rice and poured it in. Oh, man, in a moment it enlarged. It ran down the pot. And the stove that I was using was an electric stove, and it got down in the grill. Smoke's going everywhere. Smoke alarms are buzzing. The little boys are going, what is it, Daddy? And it was dinner, but uh, it was pretty awful. Good Lord. Ah, goodness. Well, I got a lot of stuff to talk about, but not in a big, big rush. But we're going to have a lunch later, so I guess I better carry on and kind of do something normal. I don't want to do something very normal to you. I like the God that surprises us, don't you? He, he surprises us. Uh, he surprised them, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, didn't he? They were all in one place, one accord, and what happened? Wham! Suddenly, say suddenly. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven. You and I better prepare ourselves for some suddenlies. Listen, this little blase they have been there, done that, seen it all. God's about to really shake us up. You believe that? Everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. And one of the things that's going to be shaken is this little smugness that you and I walk around in, acting like we really know what God's up to. Listen, he, he's going to shake that, and we're going to go, my God, I don't know, but I'm not missing it. You know what I mean? He's going to bring back the awe to the house of God. The awe, the holy reverential fear of the Lord. That awe where we go, oh God, he, see, he can do anything, can he? Listen, I am telling you, uh, he, one time he told me, he said, you better tell my people I'm not near as easy to get along with as some preachers have made me out to be. 
Yeah, remember it said it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. Got a little plastic one, you can do whatever you want to with him. Put him in your yard, put him on your car. But a living God, that's the only kind you and I have. I've, I've had preachers go, well, I'll tell you, I'm not afraid of God. Well, you're dumb. I'm more afraid of God than I am the devil. We better have a holy reverential fear of God. Now, I know we can call him uh, uh, Abba, and we can all do all. I know that, but there's two sides to God. You believe that? I, I want you to know that. We, we're about to be introduced to the holy reverential fear of the Lord. And it's really important. Uh, there's a great verse about it. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. I love it in the Amplified Version. It says, we, we need to uh, understand more about it. So here's what it says. Having these precious promises, beloved, let us purify ourselves from every bit of the contamination of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the reverential fear of the Lord. Say reverential fear. It says, bringing our consecration to completeness. I like that, don't you? We can get closer to God than we are now, can't we? Say yes. At least I hope we can. We can get closer. Say closer. That's really what I want. Can you, can you put that verse up? Is there any way to do that? Uh, you know, they were doing it like... If you put that 2 Corinthians 7, 1, the amplified version up, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll try it and see how it works. That's good. There it is. Therefore, since these great promises are ours, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates and defiles body and spirit and bring our consecration to completeness in the reverential fear of the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a question that verse causes to arise. What promise? Having these promises... What promise is going to promote purity on a level like that? Apparently we hadn't seen it yet because I know of no church that's completely sanctified body, soul, spirit. Do you? So what promise? Having therefore these promises, these great, awesome, gigantic promises. I'll tell you what promise it is. It's found in 2 Corinthians 6, being identified as the true, mature sons and daughters of Almighty God. That's the promise. Coming to a point of maturity where God can turn over to us family business. Family business. Doing business is in His name exactly like He would do it. Remember He said, as my Father has sent me, even so now I am sending you. Remember the Bible said, as He is, so are we in this present world. Uh, I, I don't like to deal with people that are confused about their identity. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now are we ambassadors for Christ. What are we now? Ambassadors for Christ. So I don't know about you, but I want to know what the heck is an ambassador? If that's what I am, what is an ambassador? When Paul wrote it, he wrote a Greek word that means senior representative sent out with authority. That's who you are right now. A senior representative sent out with authority. Next question. How much authority do I have? Same amount as the one that sent me. How much authority does he have? Matthew, what, 28, 18? All power, all authority given unto me and in heaven and in earth. So listen, we've got to understand God has commissioned us with kingdom control. God's original intent is found in Genesis 1, 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. You get to hear a conversation. You know, uh, there's a big deal right now in, 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 uh, in our nation concerning uh, the government eavesdropping in on everything people say and do. Uh, God has always done that. You believe that? He's acquainted with all of our ways. But he'll use the knowledge much better than our government will. But anyway, uh, listen, I'm telling you, it's really important to real understand that uh, God wants us to understand that he's got a commission for us and he's got something for us to do. Uh, look, look what it says here. This, this is, we get to listen into God's conversation. Then God said, this is God talking to the Holy Spirit and to Jesus. And then God said, let us, Jesus and the Holy Ghost, 
Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have what? Dominion. And that word dominion means kingdom control over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over all the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing. He says, give it all to them. Did you know, did you study the creation story? Every time he would create something, he would go, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. One time, one time only, he said, ooh, it's very good. When was that? When, when he gave them kingdom control. It's very good. Guys, I'm telling you, it brings God, it, you know, it really does give God a delight to see His children growing to the place where they can take over kingdom control. Did you know somebody's going to get back everything Adam gave up? Ask three questions all over the earth. If not now, when? If not here, where? If not you, who? You believe, you, you believe God's going to get somebody to take up the kingdom? He really is. He's looking for it. I quoted the verse last night. Second, uh, Second Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord are roving to and fro throughout the whole earth. Looking for people whose heart is upright towards Him. Hey, uh, our pastor friend from uh, uh, Bulgaria. What, I used, when the communist walls first fell down, I, I made a beeline. I, I would carry teams into Bulgaria. One of the cities we'd go into was Travna. Travna, Bulgaria. Good Lord. Mighty miracles broke out. And this is on television film. Mighty miracles broke out. We were out in an open air meeting in Travna. And the, God started healing and the people went wild. They started throwing their children on the platform. And it got so chaotic, I kept backing up, backing, and backed all the way off the platform. I'm standing on nothing. I'm standing on air in front of everybody. Wow! I jumped back on the platform and I said, God, what was that? He said, that was me keeping you from being really embarrassed. I would have just fallen off the platform. But it, they went really wild throwing their children up. Uh, but I like wild like that, don't you? Oh, man, it, it's something. I, I, I would have to dig through some old archives of the television footage, but there's programs about that. Oh, man, one, one, one of the programs, you cannot watch it without it ripping your heart out, man. In, in, in the program, we had a TV crew over there with us. And we're on the platform preaching about Jesus, about the redemptive plan of the cross. We're wooing and begging the people to come to Christ. And in this, in this crowd is a man there. All he's ever heard is communist, communist uh, indoctrination. Never heard about the freedom of the cross, the power of Jesus. And the camera zeroes in on this man. And you can see, you've never seen, he's an older man. His skin is uh, dark and wrinkled. But he's listening. I'm in the background preaching about Jesus, the freedom of the cross. And this man, the camera kind of freezes on him. And you can see it. You can see the war uh, of, the, of the mind as this guy's thinking. And I'm wooing, begging them to give their life to Jesus. And in a moment, in a moment, I, I'm asking them, if you want Jesus, raise your hand. And in a moment, this man, re his hand comes up so slow. So slow like this. And I said, repeat this prayer after me. And I'm going through the translator. You know, Lord Jesus, I know you're the Son of God. And I'll tell you, the camera's still on this man. Frozen on him. And all of a sudden, when he said, come into my heart, all of this gray, dark, uh, just vanishes away from him. A year later, I send another camera crew over there, and we find this man. All of his life, he had been a blacksmith. You know, and that's why he was so dark and his skin was so... And so, so I got the camera crew. And so we got the old footage of him there. Then 90 gets saved. This is a year later. You can't hardly recognize him. Oh, he's bright and he's full of life. And so I asked him, I said, sir. Uh, and I showed him the footage. I said, that's you. And he, yes, yes. And I said, what happened to you that night? And boy, he said in the most explosive terms, I came alive! Isn't that something? Listen, listen. The gospel brings people to life. You believe that? I came alive. Oh, man. Hey, I'll tell you another thing happened in Travis. You want to know? Okay. They called me up to the mayor's office. Yeah. They were still communists holding. The communists had tentacles in there. And so here's the deal. You wanna, you wanna, this is all true. So they're making me have this interview in the mayor's office. And the, the woman doing the interviewing is very hostile. 
And so the Lord says, sit down in the chair. Don't look at them till I tell you to look at them, but just simply answer their questions. This is, go over, this is going over all of Bulgaria. So I'm sitting there, and they're putting out questions like this. Tell me, why are you so interested in getting the message of Jesus to the children? That's a good question. And then I, I quoted the verse, Jesus says, Allow, permit little children to come unto me, for such is the king. You know, okay. So I'm answering their questions. Why are you here? And what is your purpose? And so I'm talking about I'm here to present the freedom that's in Christ. All of this. Okay, now she's hostile. And all of a sudden, I saw the microphone start shaking like this. And I looked up and she's squalling and bawling. She said, can God heal me? I meet up with cancer. I go, yeah. So she was eat up with cancer across her breast, and God healed her just like that in the mayor's office uh, in a hostile interview. See? That's the truth. Yeah. Pretty wild. But I like a wild God, don't you? I'm, I'm tired of people just thinking, well, you know, church is kind of boring. And I'll agree with you. Church shouldn't be boring, but it is just really boring. I'll tell you why a lot of people don't come. They've been here. Yeah. I'll tell you, don't go to a dead church. Well, you know, Granny used to go, Granny's dead? Come on! Listen. <laughs> don't stay in a dead church. Jesus said, let the dead bear the dead. Come on! Follow me. Yeah, I'll tell you what, just to be really honest, if your church doesn't have signs and wonders and miracles, they disqualify themselves from being a New Testament church. The early church had miracles. That's the pattern we're to follow. Mark 16, 20 said they, the early church, went out and preached and God validated what was happening with signs following. Yeah. Where are you girls from? El Salvador. That's good. You from El Salvador also? I've been there. Good Lord. I, I've been a lot of places. Yeah. I intend to go to a lot more, don't you? God will send you places. I've been to two places at one time. Hey! That'll mess with the theology, but I have. Been to two places at one time. I don't know how it works, but it's kind of fun. Yeah, I like your shirt. Like that matters. Yeah, I like it though. It's nice. Got a lot to talk about. What's your name? Boy, I like your hair. Curly. Did it come out natural or is that you do that? That's natural. Good. Gracious. That's kind of nice. First time my wife ever saw me, I shaved every hair off my head with a razor and I put Vaseline on it so it'd shine. That's the truth. This. How you doing? What's your name? Joyce. Joyce, God bless your heart. This is not the destiny of God for you in that wheelchair. You know, there's, I told you last night, there's got to come a day in the church when every person gets up out of the wheelchair, every sick person gets well. And God's going to pull that off. God's going to pull this off, pull that off. He, there's got to come a day when every sick person gets well. It says when Israel left Egypt, there was not one sick or feeble among them. So there has to come a day you pop out of there and do a little jig. That's true. I want it to be today. I do. I want it to be today. I tell you what, as far as I can decipher in the Bible, there's not one thing standing in the, a barrier. I think uh, it could happen. I really do. I expect it to happen. That, you know, that's really big to expect things to happen. If you don't expect it to happen, it won't happen. But you have, to, you have to expect it. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything we can ask or imagine. And the word imagine does expect. I expect the miracles, don't you? I'll tell you what, if you'll talk about them, you'll get them. Well, I'm going to talk about some stuff today, okay? So y'all all got a bunch of t-shirts on the light. That's nice, isn't it? I got a friend that makes t-shirts. Yeah, he does. I wish I'd have thought of it. One of his t-shirts, here's what it says. Eternity, smoking or non. <laughs> now, that's, that's a cool shirt, isn't it? I mean, that kind of covers it all, doesn't he? Then he, he runs his titles by me sometimes. and So one of the titles, he's, and I'll clean it up since we've got people watching. Uh, one of his t-shirts says, Don't be a Balaam. Get off your donkey and do something. Yeah. Yeah. 
I told him that'll have a very small market. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So I want to talk to you about this. While we were sitting there, I said, Lord, uh, what, what's the thing you want to get into the people today? Here's what he said. Tell them the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Here it is. If we don't search for him, seek for him with all our heart, we won't find him. Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13. And here it is. Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24. Psalms 129, 139, verse 23 and 24, it says, Search me, O God, and try me. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in a way that's everlasting. See, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. If we have sin, hidden sin, covered sin in our heart, God won't talk to us. You go, is that true? Yeah, there, there's the verse. Search me, O God, and know me. Try my what? Know my heart? Try me. And know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me. But he's going to ask him, search my heart. Now remember, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Psalms 66, 18. Psalm 66, 18, I said a while ago, if we hide sin in our heart, it cuts off our communication channel with God. Look at Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Wow. Serious indictment. If I have regard, if I regard iniquity in my heart, so I guess we ought to look at the word regard. What in the world does it mean? The word regard that is written right there is a word that's the same word for what a woman's body does to a fetus. What does a woman's body do to a fetus? Nurtures, feeds, protects, shelters. If we do that with sin in our life, it cuts off our communication channel with God. The Lord will not hear me. Is there any other verses in the Bible that deal with sin on pregnant terms? The Apostle James says, In sin, when it has conceived... Remember that? Oh, and lust when it has conceived. Lust when it has conceived bringeth forth sin. And when sin is full term, it births death. Remember that? So we need to get rid of that, don't we? Say, yes. I can't. That's, I want to give you some sugar on the forehead. Is that okay with you? Why, well, sure. God bless you. She's a rounder. I like that. You know, I don't know what all that means, but I'm just pretty excited about it. That's true. Why do, does, I don't want to just go along with the crowd, do you? God called us to stand up and stand out. I want to be like John the Baptist. He didn't look like the rest of the guys, didn't dress like the rest of the guys. He had something they didn't have. Anointing! He had a living relationship with God, didn't he? Yes, so the heart of the matter. So we've got to ask God to search us, try us, examine us. And then when he finds something in our heart, instead of trying to conceal it, confess it. If we'll confess it, 1 John 1, 9 says, he will forgive us. The Bible says he'll put it as far as, as the east is from the west, never to remember it again. One, trans one verse says he will drop it in the sea of his forgetfulness. Now let me tell you something. If you confess a sin and forsake that sin, if you ever hear about it again, it's from the devil, not from God. See, there's a great difference between conviction and condemnation. Holy Spirit brings conviction. The devil brings condemnation. When the Holy Spirit brings conviction... There's a shadow comes in your heart. You feel bad about the sin that you're in, and you want to confess it. You want to forsake it. But when condemnation comes, there's never a way out. There's guilt, shame, you know. Say conviction is from God. Condemnation is from the devil. So you need to find out who's dealing with you. If it's the Holy Spirit, instead of concealing it, confess it. And here, here's the greatest confession ever recorded in the, in the Bible. Psalms 51. Every other psalm in the Bible, every other psalm in the Bible is what's called poetic. It flows kind of in a poetry, 
a poetry kind of way, but not Psalms 51. Psalms 51 theologians tell us it's written in what's called ejaculatory terms. Now, it means this. Have you ever tried to converse with somebody that's overwrought with emotion? Maybe there's been a sudden death in a family. And, and people, that's the way the whole 51st Psalm is written. Every, every phrase of it. Start with Psalm 51 verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. The whole 51st Psalm is that way because... David realizes the heart of the matter is the matter of his heart. He's pride. He's, and look at it, boy. Let's throw that one up there. Psalms 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness and tender mercies. Wash me thoroughly from my sins and cleanse me from... Boy, it's really amazing. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness and according to your multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Verse 2. Wash me thoroughly. Watch this. Verse 2. Wash me thoroughly and repeatedly from my iniquities and guilt and cleanse me and make me wholly pure from my sin. Boy, look at the next one. For I acknowledge. Look at this. For I am conscious of my transgressions and I acknowledge them and my sin is ever before me. Did you know there's pleasure in sin, but it's a very shortly a pleasure? Okay. Uh, go ahead. Hey, get to verse 6. I, I, I like verse 6. Psalms 51, verse 6. This is pretty nice. Behold, you desire truth in the what? Inner being, the heart. Make me therefore to know wisdom in my innermost heart. Verse 7. There we go. Purity, uh, purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Ceremony, wash me, and I shall really be whiter than snow. I like that. Perch me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Boy, if you know anything about the Bible, that, here's what he's saying. Deal drastically with my sin. The word hyssop is a, 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 it's a weed, like a, a strong, a, a very bristly weed. They would use it if somebody had advanced leprosy. They would take that hyssop weed and scrub away the rotten, putrefying flesh down to new flesh. And that's what he's saying. Purge me. What is purge? Purge starts on the inside and makes it way, its way out. See, religion tries to clean up the cancer of sin from the outside. But re this, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. You have to clean up from the inside out. You see that? Perch me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. What was David before he was king? Shepherd! Okay. Have you ever read the Bible and you go, my God, I don't know what that's talking about. The bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. See, David was a shepherd. He was, he was drawing from his shepherd's knowledge. A shepherd of a sheep. He, had, he carried a staff, remember that? A, approximately seven and a half feet tall, the, the stick with a crook on it. He used it for protection and direction for the sheep. And so if the little rebellious lamb wouldn't stay with the flock, <coughs> where's the worst place for a lamb? Away from the flock. Away from the shepherd. Predators out there, wolves, bears, okay? So the shepherd would take the stick and he would put it around the lamb's little neck, and bring him back. But suppose the little lamb didn't like it. He'd just keep on running away. The bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Here's one of the duties of the shepherd. He would take the little rebellious lamb, pick it up, lay the staff across his leg, and take the little lamb's leg and pow! Break the lamb's leg. You see, a cruel shepherd, right the contrary. Because then he carries a shepherd's pouch. Have you ever seen Indians swaddle their babies? That's a shepherd's pouch. He would put the broken-legged lamb in the shepherd's pouch. Everywhere he went, against his body, rubbed the wounded lamb. And lambs, leg heels. And these shepherds tell us, the Bedouin shepherds tell us, lambs that have gone through that process never want to leave the shepherd again. The bones which thou hast broken. Let me tell you something. You better thank God, praise God, Hold on to God. Every time He deals with you, He deals with you because He loves you. 
I want to tell you something, and those of you watching, and those of you right here, if you can habitually continue to sin and get by with it, you've never been born again. If you can habitually, constantly, sin and get by with it, and you don't have the bone-breaking dealings of God, you've never been saved. The Bible said if you be, be without chastisement, you're illegitimate. Illegitimate means no birth papers. See, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Well, okay. Well, what happens when He renews you? Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit then. Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners are going to get converted unto you. See, when you get your heart right, you're happy, and then you want to tell everybody about it. That's what it says. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, then I'll teach transgress transgressors your way. We need to be happy hearted. Now, what's the benefit of having a happy heart? Longevity of life. A merry heart does good like a medicine. What's the benefit of getting into the secret place of God? Isn't it Psalms 91 verse 1? I, I like the process of getting into the secret place, don't you? Yes. What's the process? How do we get in the secret place? Psalms 24, 3 and 4. I love the Bible. It never asks a question without releasing an answer. I don't like human philosophy. It always raises questions with no answers. But the Bible never raises a question without issuing the answer. Here's the question, Psalms 24, 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Question, answer. He who has clean hands and a what? Pure heart. See, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. See, if you're getting into his holy hill, it's with clean hands, pure heart. Now, I like that. I like that we can ascend into the hill of the Lord. But there's something better than ascending to the hill of the Lord. What in the world could that be? Oh, I'll tell you. It's Psalms 15, verse 1. Abiding in His holy hill. One is visitation, others habitation. I love visitation, but I long for... Have, here it is, John, John 15, 1. Lord... Who may abide in your holy hill? Who may dwell in your holy I want to, don't I want to abide. I love visitation, but we long for habitation. In it Ephesians 2, 22, we're a holy habitation, a house built for God to dwell in. Yeah, that's right. See, the matter of the heart. Uh -huh. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God's Spirit. I want him to live big in here, don't you? I don't want him to find anything in here that's repulsive to him. Create in me a, and a, renew in me a right spirit. I want that, don't you? It's really important. And now let me tell you about uh, concealed sin. Sometimes it can be there and you not even know it. It's really true. So what we need to do is ask the Holy Ghost to search us. And then when he puts his finger on it, just say, Oh God, please extract this from me. And guess what he will? The shame will go, the guilt will go. And boy, you'll, you'll just be alive with the vibrancy of the Holy Ghost. I want that, don't you? Do you believe people can tell if you're walking with God? I don't, want, I don't want an anointing that leaves when I walk out of the building. I'll tell you what, it's happened thousands of times. I walk into the elevator and people just fall out. I'm not praying in tongues. I'm not shaking. No, I'm just trying to get to the room. I'm honest to God, if you can turn it off, I don't believe it's the Holy Ghost. That's true. Yep. Did I tell you when I went to, well, I'll just tell you. I was over there at a, uh, in, in, I think it's Abbotsford. And the Lord had told me, he said, I want you to get a watch. Now, I had, I've got watches. But the Lord said, I want you to get a watch. I said, okay. So I, I, I want to get one that had that little beaver on it, that roots looking thing. So anyway. So I go to the, I go to the mall there. 
And uh, so we're there at a watch counter. Just, I'm, I'm just there at the watch counter. And there's a lady, a wonderful uh, a Canadian lady. And so I said, uh, ma'am, I'd like to look at that watch over here. Wasn't it an expensive watch? Just 20 maybe $20. I'm not sure. And she said to me, you're not from around here, are you? I don't know where she got that. But anyway, <laughs> she said to me, you're not from around here, are you? Now, I'm, there's a glass case between me and her. And I said to her, no, ma'am. I'm just passing through. When I said, no, ma'am, I'm passing through, the Holy Ghost hits her and knocks her down. Wham! She hits the floor and she's drunk. Just drunk and laughing and giggling. <laughs> just like that. And her worker comes running out of a little cubicle over there. And the lady's on the floor going, he's not from here. He's passing through. And she said, you're what? I said, I'm passing. Wham! She's down. Honest to God, so help me God. In a moment, six or seven of their workers are down behind the counter, absolutely drunk in the Holy Ghost. I could have got the watch for free. And I turn around and there's maybe 60 to 80 people that have gathered watching this. See? I mean the Holy Ghost. He gets on you and in you, and you need to let Him out. You know what? See? Well, um, nothing like that ever happens to me. People ask me. They ask me, they go, how does the Holy Ghost use you? And here's the way. The Holy Ghost has no hands till you give Him yours. So I say to the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, these are not my hands, they're yours. Holy Ghost has no eyes. And I say, Holy Ghost, these are your eyes. Yield your members to Him. But have your members clean and pure. He won't come upon a contaminated vessel. Be ye clean that bear the vessel of the Lord, the Bible says. You yield him your members, he'll use you. You believe that? You're the vehicle. Don't, don't you? I've always, I love fearless people. Don't you? I love people that are bold and, listen, I don't like little wussy, wimpy. Yeah. Oh my God. You better be bold and brave. Here, here's one of the boldest, bravest people I found in the Bible. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Here she is. Fifteen and a half years old. That's right. And she's out in the backyard. I'll paraphrase. She's out in the backyard. Boom, boom, boom. A being from another world flies in. And goes, hello there, girl. You've been chosen by God. Here's what's going to happen to you, honey. The Holy Spirit is going to get on you and in you, and you're going to get pregnant, but don't worry, it's God. Say new thing. Never had there been an, an announcement like that. What does Mary say? Let me call my prayer chain and see what they say. Nope. What does Mary say? Be it unto me according to thy word. See, it's going to take a fearless faith, faith like that and a, a womb open for God to birth something new. Be it unto me according to thy word. Whew. You talk about abandoned, radical faith. That gal had it. Wouldn't you have loved to have been in the bagel shop when she told Joe? Remember she was engaged to a boy named Joe? Remember that? I, I'm pretty sure this generation she had a text. Hey Joe, let's meet at the Starbucks. Or maybe Tim Hortons. Yeah, Came Canadian Tim Hortons, isn't it? Let's meet at Tim Hortons. And so they meet down there at Tim Hortons. They've got some coffee and maybe a, a roll. And you know, you just can't slide into a conversation like this. She says, Joe, I'm pregnant, but don't worry, it's God. <laughs> Did Joe go, shaka la la la? No, he jumped up and tried to Google a lawyer to dump the dame. Is this true? That's what it says. He pondered, how can he divorce her? But what happened in a dream? God convinced him. But do you see what I'm saying? Fearless faith. Well, you know, 
No, here's a, a girl that's less than 16 years old and says, I'll do it. I, whatever you've instructed me, I'm going to do it. Well, I'll tell you, she learned that, didn't she? Later on, the first miracle Jesus does in Cain of Galilee, John 2, 11. Remember that? Remember, remember it said there was a wedding? Jesus and his disciples were invited, and he went. And they did something strange. They ran out of wine. And so Mary, the mother of Jesus, remember that? She's talking to Jesus, and I'll just paraphrase. She says to him, hop to it, boy! And then here's what he says to her. You may have birthed me, but you will not manipulate me. See, what's killed every move of God till this present moment, whoever God used to birth it, they think they own it. You may have birthed me, but you will not manipulate me. Whoa, what have I to do with thee, woman? My hour is not yet come. Remember the story? And then something strange happens. She goes, ding! And then the Lord told me one time, he said, Bobby, that's me. Would you like a prophetic word you could give to anybody in the whole world if they would obey it? It would guarantee them great success. Would I like a prophetic word I could give to anybody in the whole world if they obeyed it, it would guarantee them? Yes! I, I would. And it's the next utterance from the lips of Mary, the mother of Jesus. After he was rebuked, she was rebuked by her son. You may have birthed me. You won't manipulate me. Then she goes, okay. So she goes to his disciples and here's the word. Whatever he says to do, do it. That's it. You do that. Oh, there's, there's kind of a little, don't tell him what's under there. See, if I was real prophetic, I'd know, you know. Yeah. Whatever he says to do, do it. Boy, didn't he tell them to do something strange? Remember the disciples? What, what, what did he tell them to do? There were six water pots over against the door. How many? Six. And all theologians go, well, they were stone pots. They were, no, no, no. They were earthen vessels. What was, what was the first man created in his name? What was his name? Adam! Adam means red dirt. That's exactly what those pots were made out of. How many were they? Six, that's us, man. They were empty, waiting, longing. And the, the Lord Jesus told his disciples, go fill them to the what? Very brim with water. Water's the word. Now here's the problem. The disciples knew what they poured in, had no clue what they poured out. They poured it in, poured it out, and he said, carry this to the governor of the feast. So the governor of the feast took a little sip out of the crock. And he goes, whoa! It's a new thing. Most people serve the best at the beginning. But he's done a new thing. He saved the best for. Well, you ought to rejoice if you realize we're the last days. But I like that. See, our problem is we know what we pour in, but we have no clue what he's trusting us with. New thing. Eh, there it is. I heard it. You like, like Mr. Ed. Yeah, that's, oh, that's good. What's your name? Hi, oh, Wendy. God bless you. What do you do? Do you? That's a good thing. That's good. You enjoy it? Yeah, and I work at the church too. The church all over. And I do enjoy it. Really. I'm having the time of my life, honestly. It would take a ton of... I, every day, so help me God, every day I get stacks of invitations to go somewhere in the world. Every day. It would take lifetimes to fulfill it. Here's what the Lord told me. He said, don't go unless you sin. Yeah, don't go unless you sin. So that's a good one. I scheduled to go to 28,000 people and 13 people opened up. And the Lord said, I want you to go over here. I said, God, it looks like I'd reach more people at 28,000 than 13, not 13,000, 10 plus 3. 13 people. And I said, God, I figure I'd reach more people. And he said, that's why you need me to do your scheduling. You don't know how to figure. So he sent me to 13 people. And great things happen for the kingdom. It's true. You believe great things are going to happen for you? That's right. That's exactly right. 
You don't believe he really hears you. He hears you. While you're crying out, he's going to answer you. Did you know? Here's your verse. You ready? Pop this one on the board, please, in the Amplified. John 16, 24. It says, up until this point of time, you've not asked. Ask now. You'll get what you're asking, so you'll have a happy heart. Here it is, John 16, 24. Here we go. Up to this time, you have not asked a single thing in my name as presenting all that I am, but now ask and keep on asking and you will receive so that your joy and gladness and delight might be overflowing. We're in a season, God will answer you for Next one, please. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6. I want to go to two, but go to one first. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. Amplified, please. It is. Look at here. Can you, can you imagine? Look. Laboring together as God's fellow workers with Him. It means we're laboring with Him. Okay. I'm screaming, just, but I'll read it. For He said, no, no. Back, back up. Let me finish that first one, please. Yes, there we go. Laboring together as God's fellow workers with him, then we beg of you not to receive the grace of God in vain, that merciful kindness by which he exerts his holy influence on souls and turning them to Christ, keeping and strengthening them. Do not receive this for no purpose. See, the gifts and the graces you get, you've got it for a reason. And here's the reason. For he says, in the time of favor, of an assured welcome, I have listened to you, I've heeded your call, and I have helped you on the day of deliverance, the day of salvation. Behold, now is truly the time for a gracious welcome and acceptance of you from God. Behold, now is the day of salvation. What's the first three words? For he says, anytime you find for he says, it's quoting somebody. wonder who Paul's quoting. Do you know the Bible? He's quoting Isaiah 49, verse 8. He's, that's what Paul's quoting for. He says, he's quoting Isaiah 40. Pop that one in, please. I'm just ordering you, please. If it's possible, could you please present Isaiah 49, verse 8. Look, he got it right. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable and favorable time, I have heard and answered you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you, and I will preserve you and give you for a covenant to the people to raise up and establish the land from its present state of ruin and the appropriation and cause him to inherit the desolate moral waste of heathenism. That's their destiny or their inheritance. To turn mankind to the saving knowledge of Christ. He said, that's your, that's your, that's your design. That's your, do you see it? And this is the acceptable time to do that. Oh, it's about, oh, it's an acceptable time for lunch. For y'all's meeting. Okay. I think we're coming back. We're having, is there a two o'clock meeting? Or there's, they're soaking. I like soaking. Psalms 91 soaking. Don't you? Pop that one up, please. Psalms 91, verse 1. Here it is. Psalms 91, verse 1. You know what the Lord told me once? He said, I shout my truths, but I whisper my secrets. scared you but I'm I'm very animated Psalms 91 Psalms 91 verse 1 talking about this soaking here it is he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the almighty whose power no foe can withstand when you soak and abide under his presence no, no two the devil fashions can hinder you. Do you believe in Christ you're invincible? Yeah, there's a lot about that. Got to go now. What do you do? Sales and marketing. How's it going good? Good. What do you sell? Just hot tubs. That's, I already like that. Hot tubs, yeah. That's good. A lot of things I'm thinking about, but none of them will do to talk about. But uh, 
Yeah. Hot tubs. Yeah. I like the relaxation, don't you? That's what we need to learn how to relax before the Lord. And that's one of the that's one of the words. It's isn't it Psalms? Uh, Psalms fifty five twenty two casting all of your care upon him because he cares for you. Uh, casting your burden on the Lord, releasing the weight of it, and He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be moved, made to slip or fall or to fail. So you're invincible in Jesus. That's right. That was a good. I enjoyed the praise time. That was fun. There's songs in you and write them now. Don't just sing them. Write them. That's well, well, I gotta go. You doing good? Me too. Huh? She's got her own headphones. Hello. Oh, that's wonderful. She's got some little pink headphones. She, the baby's going, my God, he's over here and he's loud. But, uh, my little grandson, we got, we got. Three grandsons, and we finally got a little granddaughter. She's the first girl in the family, and she's four. So she calls me the other day, and she says, Papa Preach, would you get me a pink 22? Hey, that's a, that's a little gun. Now, you know you're a redneck if your four-year-old granddaughter wants you to buy her a pink 22. And I said, yeah, I will, honey. And her daddy said, you're not buying her a pink 22. She's four years old. Well, I am. He just won't give it to her, you know. But, yep, that's the honest to God truth. Papa Priest, buy me a pink 22. Uh, well, it's like you said, sometimes it's just okay. Yeah. One of, the, one, of the, one of the names of God is the God that's more than you'll ever have need of. El Shaddai. The God that does for you what you're incapable of doing for yourself. You can come to Him, and you'll never ask Him something too big. Listen, it's His pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's right. Yeah, good. What's your wife's name? Ileana. God bless you. You're smart as a whip. That's a good thing. And I see you with a can of oil. That's a good thing. She's oiling the wheels, man, and that's good. Well, that's good. I'm just shouting at folks as we go. We got to leave, though, because y'all have got a banquet. Are you going to the banquet? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's good. Huh. I know I'm supposed to quit, but I don't really want to. I tell you, I feel, I feel very mischievous at this moment. I really mean that. I feel uh, a bit mischievous. I don't know why, but I do. I feel, I feel like God could do anything. 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 He's going to recreate bones in people's feet. Somebody's had some deterioration of bones in their feet, and God's going to recreate those bones. Here's your great verse right now. Heaven is screaming. I mean, heaven is screaming. He's screaming, Joel 2.25, I will restore. I will restore. You know, last night I almost said, uh, it's a, uh, you know, when I, I said, I thought, and I, I was going to say, it's a wonder they let you meet in this place. Now, you know what I was walking through this morning? And if they keep monkeying around, God will give you this place. Look out now. I'm telling you. You say, God, yes, He will. He'll raise up training centers like this. I'm telling you. Listen, you go, I don't believe. Well, yeah, He will. It's your father's good pleasure. That's right. Well, you know. Nope. He will. So that's what I, I felt. And then I was back there when I got to feeling mischievous. And the Lord said, you know, nothing's impossible for me. You know, when these executives start saying, well, I don't know if these kind of conferences are beneficial to us. You, you monkey around, God will make you give them this place. That's true. That's right. Wouldn't that be neat? Yeah, you'd get a job. You could have a job doing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I was in, well, okay, I was in Houston, Texas one time. They had the fastest real estate market in, in, in America at that time. That's when the oil was at its highest point. And I'm standing in Houston, Texas, and God said, oh, and by the way, tell them I'm going to crucify the oil God in Texas, and they'll be giving real estate away. I said, God! But I'd already said it. Guess what happened? Bottom fell out of the oil market. People shot themselves. People jumped off of bank buildings. And they started giving real estate away in Houston, Texas. They, big malls had built. Nobody would come occupy them. So the malls started giving the mall spaces away to churches and the ministries to keep the thugs out. Yep. Well, that's how it goes. See, God can do it. Remember Marilyn Hickey? She wanted to buy some property across from a mall to build a church. And the whole town rose up and didn't want a church around the mall. Remember that? They withstood here, Marilyn Hickey. So guess what happened? The mall went broke. She bought it for pennies on the dollar. She moved into the mall. Got a church called Happy Church. Don't have a sad church. Have a happy church. Yeah, that's true. Well, we got to go now. What are y'all doing now? Uh, we look after a couple of ministries. Uh, one in Israel and one here in northern Canada. Good. That's where y'all... Did I tell you an angel followed me from uh, Israel to Canada? I'll watch your angels. So help me, God. Your number one call in Canada is to pray for Israel. Amen. Number one call in Canada is to pray for Israel. So help me, God. An angel followed me from uh, Israel to uh, Hamilton, Ontario. Honest to God. He said, you know my name? I go, no. And he used a Hebrew word. And he said, you know what it means? And I go, no. And he said, it means watcher. That's, well, I'm screwed. So I said, what's this about? He said, I'm calling Canada to stand in the gap and be a watcher for Israel. Your number one initiative from heaven is to pray for Israel. And God, God wouldn't have sent those angels if he hadn't intended to commission you for it. One of our reasons we're uh, in our nation is so uh, devastated right now is because we've distanced ourselves from Israel. If we continue, it's going to get worse and worse. So we're, we're really, really trying to raise our people up. Well, anyway, God bless you. Let me, uh, tonight we'll pray for people. Seven o'clock, we're going to have an impartation service. Here's one thing God's been doing is praying over pieces of cloth. We've seen dead people raised with this. We Listen. So tonight, bring something. Bring a handkerchief, a nap. Don't steal the hotel stuff, but you know, bring something and we'll pray over it. We prayed, we announced that we was going to pray over cloth in Korea. They sold out every napkin, every handkerchief in Seoul, Korea. You could not buy a piece of fabric. This is the truth. And my wife and I prayed for thousands of people. And so I'm telling you, can I tell you one story about the napkin? Okay, my mama, my mother, she, God raised her from the dead twice. That ain't bad for a Southern Baptist, you know, but uh, that's true. God raised my mother from the dead twice. He told me it's my will to keep her the second time, but your prayers overrode my will. But anyway, my mama got a hole in her stomach, and her food started leaking out into her cabinet. So the doctor said, this is very serious, so we got to do something. So they carried my mother to the hospital, and me and my wife go there. And they got my mother in a chair, sort of like a dentist chair. They spray some stuff in her mouth, and they make her swallow a camera, a little Sony camera on a on a. a, a a string looking thing so she swallows the camera and they turn the light on the camera light on in my mommy's tummy and there's the TV a Sony TV and it's vivid color and the guys the doctors manipulating the camera with the joystick and it crawls up this way and there's the hole you can see the hole in my mommy's tummy about the size of two golf balls horrible looking rotten deteared fle flesh hanging off and so you can see it very clear. And the doctor said, boy, this is very serious. We're going to have to do something to uh, cauterize this hole. Dot, dot. And my mother starts going, oh, she's got a tube down her throat like this. Aah. So I thought, oh, God, it's hurting her. So I get closer and I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, console her, you know. And she's going, Aah. and so I turn like this and she starts digging in my pocket. She digs out my handkerchief, throws it over the place. And right there on television, the hole starts growing up. The doctors start taking still pictures of what's happening on the video. And in a moment, the hole is completely grown up, just as smooth as baby skin. They pull that camera out of my mama's mouth. Guess what she said? My God, boy, what took you so long? That's what she said. Yeah. Now, it's the truth. Yeah. 
So if it happened in God's time, in Paul's time, it can happen in our time. It says they took off the body of Paul anything that had touched his skin. And they sent it out and miracles happened. Any, that's what it says. Adios. How do you say adios? How do you say, adios. Okay. Adios. How do you say friend? Amigo. I am bilingual. Yes. Did you know I went to London, England and had to have an interpreter? That's the honest to God truth. I went to London, England and had to have an interpreter. They said, what language are you speaking? I said, English? And it offended them. Now here's the deal, just to be honest with you. When you hear God speak, He speaks just like me. Yeah. No, I'll tell you how He speaks, you want to know? He speaks exactly like you listen. John 10, 3, John 10, 27. God bless you. We'll pray for people tonight. Okay?